Thank you so much, Keith. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to um, be able to present a topic that I'm pretty passionate about. If you've um, worked with me at all, I kind of love ultrasound uh, and I really enjoy teaching it. And I really find that the uh, application of lung ultrasound is really vast and teaching it to you all uh, as RTs is very, um, it's a really cool skill to have. And I think it's very doable. Um, there's a lot of content I have to present today. It's not meant to overwhelm you at all. It's just really to show you how um, you can use it in your practice and maybe convince wherever you are to invest in that purchase and maybe even pique your interest to get more training. But this is really just the tip of the iceberg. It's kind of an introduction. Um, so hopefully you all enjoy it. Um, so like Keith said, I have incorporated something called Slido into my presentation. So hopefully you can get some interaction from y'all. If you are unable to um, if you're on your phone, it'll be hard to do. Um, just put your answer in the chat if you don't mind everyone seeing who you are. Um, so our first question was, where do folks practice? And there's a few states here represented and a lot of Texans. And we're going to go to the next slide and pull this question. So if you want to pull your phones out again, have you ever seen long ultrasound performed? I wanted to kind of get an um, idea of the audience and you know, if you've ever seen it in your practice and not in your practice, um, in a presentation. I s will start from a lot of basics, so hopefully that's good. I just hopefully not everyone in here is an expert because then I don't know what I will be able to teach you. Oh, wow. 50-50 split of my 10 that are, oh, mostly no's in the chat, though. I'll give just a few more seconds. Oh, no, there are 40 participants-ish, so if we could get... 20% of those, it would be pretty cool. All right, I feel like it's about 50-50, though mostly no's in the chat. All right, there's a third question. Have you ever personally performed lung ultrasound? And my Peter peeps, you guys better answer yes, or I'll be very sad. Handful of yeses and nos in the chats. Ooh. Okay. If I had my way entirely, I would be on camera with an ultrasound machine with a model and have you all in the classroom with me so we could get hands-on probes, but that might be iteration, I don't know, 2.0 of uh, Mr. Barnes's CEUs. Great. All right, so objectives of this talk. Um, oh, one, I should say I have no disclosures. I forgot to include that slide. I have no disclosures, financial or otherwise, um, for any of these companies or brand or trade names or anything like that. I just practice medicine and take care of patients best I can. Uh, so hopefully, uh, at the end of this talk, you can describe the basic physics behind using ultrasound, identify the basic modes of ultrasound, recognize the image artifacts produced by ultrasound, and obviously for you all, apply lung ultrasound to identify potential cause of respiratory distress or failure in y'all's everyday practice. Um, mostly, of course, I work critical care here at the Level 1 Trauma Center. I don't do any trauma. I'm all medical. And so any kind of outpatient applications, if you are interested, I can um, touch on a little bit how you might be able to use that if you are more in a outpatient setting, um, rehab center, that kind of thing. And then describe how POCUS, which is um, short for point of care ultrasound, can be used for clinical assessment and management. Very brief history. There will not be a quiz. If you're worried about phlegm fighter, I will not put dates in there. I'm not that mean. Um, but basically, it was actually discovered in the 1700s as far as the theory of how bats for echolocation, they send out a signal and it bounces off the cave walls and they can kind of gauge distance. In the 1900s, um, similarly, they used it for um, detecting objects underwater. And then in the 1940s was really where the first medical applications were being used. And interestingly, they were using it um, in the brain, which if you know anything about ultrasound, scanning through a skull or bone is actually very challenging. Basic physics, so they utilize something in the probes called the piezoelectric effect, piezo just meaning pressure. If you have watched me do ultrasound at all, you notice I can't, uh, carry my handy uh, fanny pack, which has a butterfly. It is a brand that is um, a company that developed a portable ultrasound that you can just plug into your smartphone and carry it around with you. Um, 
the technology in those is not the same as um, the piezoelectric effect. If you have the regular ultrasound machines that are rolling around, they actually have crystals inside the probe. So that's why we get really uh, upset if we drop the probes on the floor because it bounces off the floor and the crystals kind of scattered and you no longer have those really nice planes that get sent. Um, but basically the probe will send off a signal to an object and that object will reflect back the sound and produce an image. It just kind of listens. Uh, I'll talk to you about the different modes in which the screen can produce an image. For ultrasound, there are two things to be aware of as far as distances. We call the near field the area closest to the probe, and the far field is the it's very. Mm -hmm. I try not to teach hard concepts, but sometimes all of these numbers and things can be overwhelming. Um, but this is the probe what it sees closely versus what it sees at the further distances, it does kind of change and alter the image. So when we're talking about mm -hmm. principles and basics of ultrasound, when you put your hand on a probe, the object of interest should be in the middle of the screen to have the best image quality. So this is an image of a lung, whether you uh, recognize that or not. Um, the point of that is the probe is actually gonna be here. This is where the skin is. This blue box is showing you the near field and the yellow box is um, showing you the far field. Other terms that you should be familiar with with ultrasound is the echogenicity that an object produces. So the more waves are reflected, the brighter. And so if it's brighter, we consider that to be hyperechoic or white. So something that is reflecting a lot of ultrasound waves will be something like the diaphragm or bone. Isochoic or echogenic can be challenging to understand because it's similar to the tissue next to it. And these are all shades of gray, liver, kidney, muscle. If there is no ultrasound waves reflected, it is considered anechoic, completely black. If you're somewhere between isochoic and hypoechoic, it'll be like a darker shade of gray, and that can be fluid, blood, or fat. Uh, blood and fluid generally are anechoic. They don't reflect any ultrasound waves. So if you noticed, I have intentionally left off the organ of interest for all of you all. So I'm gonna show you what that would look like, hyperechoic being white, anechoic being black, and as you go down, they just might be darker shades of gray, no references to anything in pop culture. Here's just another visual example, cartoon, and this is what it actually looks like on a, uh, a model, this is not a human being, um, isochoic, hypoechoic, hyperechoic, anechoic. So hopefully someone's, everyone's still with us. What echogenicity would you expect the lung to be? Those are your choices, hyperechoic white, isochoic, hypoechoic, anechoic, I have no idea, or F, it depends. Please answer now. So think about your organ. Think about what it does. And think about how it might show up on the ultrasound. This is kind of a hard question. So don't feel bad. I have a brave soul who has selected B, even though I didn't put alphabet letters on there on this one, sorry. Oh, I got six people. Let's see. Oh, um, I wonder if it shows me in real time. Let me. Ah, oh, there we go. You can you can continue to vote though. I did show you once I clicked it. You know what the answer is. Sorry. <laughs> Dang it. I'm still working on this. So I've got votes pretty much every everyone put something, which is totally fine. I love you y'all that said I have no idea. That's fantastic. That's why I put it as a choice. And no one picked hyperechoic, though I would love to ask somebody who picked something else. I could call out, I could call out people, but I think they may hate me, like Juliana, because I know her and I work with her. So the answer is it depends. So then you'll ask why. Your lung should be full of air when it's normal. So on the screen, you may not see anything at all. And it may show up looking anechoic but it's not fluid. However, if your lung is full of junk, sputum, pneumonia, 
air is not getting to those alveoli. And so what happens is it turns into a piece of steak. When I say steak, I don't mean to offend anyone. It's just the organ meat, like a liver, which could be isocoic. Or you could have, you know, pleural fluid surrounding the lung, which collapses the lung from the outside, also creating the appearance of meat because the air can't get to that part or atelectasis. So it really does depend and hopefully um, that didn't make it more confusing. And we're gonna see lots of examples of how the, how the lung looks like an ultrasound. It depends. Other terms that you should be familiar with is frequency. This is just another basic ultrasound physics type word. And you all should be very familiar with frequency because you know how fast people breathe and we have it notated as F on the vent, right? So frequency, how fast you breathe. So if you think about your vent waveforms, the more or the higher the respiratory rate in the same amount of time is kind of how we'll look at how ultrasound waves are also sent. Uh, but this is basically a very silly cartoon of what the ultrasound frequencies, how high the frequencies are that bats can hear. We cannot hear ultrasound. We hear between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. And elephants actually are real, real low. This will be the first reference to elephants. So higher frequency, shorter wavelength. In order to fit the same amount into that time, you have many, many, many more um, waves. If it's a lower frequency, the wavelengths are longer, so there's less of them. And how this is helpful to know is what probe do I need to grab if I'm looking at the lung? Really, how far do I need, how far is the object of interest? So the way that I like to think about it so it's not confusing is if you have higher frequency, it doesn't travel as far. It can't travel as far. You're sending more um, sound waves to it. And you have a better picture, but um, if you would like to use the hummingbird as an example, it's just flapping its wing really, really, really fast. It's really, really pretty, but it's pretty shallow. If you want to insert blonde joke here, you can. If you use a probe that has lower frequency, it actually can get to tissues that are deeper, that's not as clear. So kind of low, and I can see deeper. And this is my attempt at a low voice. Thank you, insert laugh. So you see lots of different shape probes here. There's a square probe and a curvilinear probe here, and this, this is called linear array. And they all have different megahertz in which they can see. Other folks will call it the cardiac probe, or the abdominal probe, or the linear probe. And you have no idea which probe to grab. To be honest, you can look at the lung on any of these. But the question is, what are you looking at? If you just want to look at the pleura, it's pretty superficial. You pick something that is superficial, and you get a really good picture of the pleura. Honestly, you can use either the cardiac or abdominal. You know, the lung ultrasound has not been around that long, so no one calls it the lung probe. But you guys can call it the lung probe if you want. But all of these probes technically could be used. The images that you get based on the probe that you select will be different. However, if you see an image, hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll be able to see an image and know what probe they used. This is another image of lung on ultrasound so using a phased array probe. I will talk about the artifacts that are created and what you're seeing here, but I just want you to get the general idea. The phased array probe will be a bit um, narrower and a little bit curvy at the top, but it's not curvilinear. A linear array is completely straight at the top. And a linear array, again, is looking at something very superficial. A curvilinear is, as the name might suggest, there's a little bit of combination of a linear array with a little bit of phase array, but the probe itself, if you look back, is a lot bigger. You can see a lot more rib spaces with that than you can this. This is why they call it cardiac, because you can fit this little square into the rib space, um, right, second, third intercostal space anteriorly to see the heart, because that's all they're looking at. This one actually can be nicer, because you see more of lung. Lung's a much bigger organ. So phase array, linear array, curve linear array. All of these images that I've shown you are lung. I'm a big Pixar fan, so there are a few references to sea creatures and Finding Nemo and planes. So planes are very important. I'm sure you have studied this when you look at CAT scans, but just try to reorient you. Planes are very important to know how to hold the probe. So we break up the body into three different planes, sagittal, left to right, coronal front to back, transverse is head to feet. 
when you're doing a CAT scan, generally you all are looking at the transverse plane. So here's an image of CAT scan. CAT scan, obviously gold standard, looking at your lung all at one, one shot. I'm not saying ultrasound is going to replace CAT scans, but sometimes you just can't get to CT. So there's that. So sagittal, left to right, coronal front to back, transverse head to feet. And why I want you to know these really well in your mind is when you're holding the probe, if you hold the probe right there, fifth, sixth intercostal space, your probe marker should be towards the head. You should get a slice of tissue, slice of image, something like this, um, but obviously in a much smaller area. Review of anatomy, skin, muscle, intercostal, ribs, ribs, pleura, lung. So we got cartoon blending into what the ultrasound looks like. This image should be seared into your mind when you're using the, you should do more questions audience. Maybe folks in the chat can put, what probe was used to acquire this image? That's straight across. Let's see if anybody's brave. Linear, very good. Linear, because it's straight across. You only see one intercostal space here, right? You've got a rib here and a rib here, and you're just seeing what's happening between those two ribs. As you get faster and more efficient, you can slide down rib, 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 and get a picture of the lung pretty, pretty clearly. So skin is here. We got some sub Q tissue, rib, pleural line. So the pleural line is created where the visceral and parietal pleura rub together. What is the viscera? What is the parietal? So the viscera is just what is the white shiny stuff that's attached on this side of the ribs. The parietal is the stuff that covers the organ of interest. And those two surfaces rub together, which create this pleural line. Here you go. So this is only half of the image. So again, you got a rib and the pleural line. You got some muscles there. If you notice, this rib has a hyperechoic or white line. The pleural line also is hyperechoic, but what's behind them, so remember the probe is up here, what's behind them is very different. you got bone, the sound bounces back to the machine and it cannot see anything behind it, so we call this a shadow. Here, you actually see shades of gray um, and whether or not that lung is fully aerated or not, we'll talk about that and how it looks, but then you know you're on a rib. And it's totally normal to not see anything behind bone. Your pleural line should be smooth. Um, you'll see folks describe it as bat wing, which for the life of me, I could not figure out what that meant. Um, hopefully you all can see it. I think it's more like a seagull, a seagull, like, a, like if you just drew it with a pencil. Wings, their body and wings. I think that's the idea. But you want to acquire this image. So you've got rib shadow, pleural line, rib shadow, and you'll, you'll scan all the way down. More um, examples of pleural lines, but you can see they look very different than this one. Nice and smooth, pretty healthy. I don't have any motion here, but we'll see how it's supposed to move on other slides. These are lumpy bumpies. Lumpy bumpies could be pathologic. So when you're scanning, um, if you have an institution that's going to uh, use this for y'all's assessment, which is very within your scope, I, um, I would advocate for y'all using that. You could create a, a note template that said pleural line, smooth, slides, we'll talk about sliding lung, or pleural line, rough, and the doc or the medical team can start interpreting whatever it is that you're looking at. Here's a nice example of lung slide. Hopefully you can all see that moving. It is shimmering. Some people describe it as ants on a log, um, however you want to see it, but this is the pleural line. You will see muscle artifact if they're moving or if they're really tr struggling to breathe. You may see them moving their muscle a bit, but this is what you're going for. Now, I have a comment here about no pneumothorax. So this is one of the clinical applications. If you see lung slide at this location, you have visceral and parietal pleura. That means the lung has to be up because that lung slide is created by that movement. And if you have a lung that is down, there is a physical separation between the two and you will not see this. All right, kind of a lot of, I was trying, I kind of jumped in a little bit for the pathology, but I'll go back a bit because I'll talk about more pathology later. 
the different modes in ultrasound, I told you the probe sends out ultrasound waves and it listens back. And when it listens back, it can produce an image. And normally what you'll see is that B mode, um, which, are, which is shown here. Um, and if you're looking, you can say that that's not a lung, that is liver, L is for liver, D is diaphragm, S is probably stomach. No, that can't be stomach, because um, this, this might be spleen. In any case, down here is M mode. So B mode is actually stand for brightness. It is just the image that is software that collects all its information and spits it out of the picture in real time. M mode will freeze this image on some machines or some machines it will show you a live image. It actually shoots a beam of ultrasound just down that line. That's it, one slice over time. So it's showing you motion. And this will be easier to see when you have a live image, but M mode can be helpful and we'll show you um, how that is helpful. A mode is no longer used. It's very antiquated, but A mode is literally the collection of dots. And if you scan eyeballs, apparently. D mode, Doppler. Doppler um, probably won't be super useful and applicable for y'all's purposes, so I'm just going to skip it. Everything you see on the ultrasound screen is an artifact. It is not actual, I mean, if that makes sense. It's the difference between direct laryngoscopy and video laryngoscopy. Direct, you're actually looking at it with your eyeballs. Video is the interpretation of what the camera sees onto a screen. So same thing here. These image artifacts you're going to describe and learn and love. The first of these is called A-lines. A-lines are considered reverberation. They are horizontal. They are parallel to the plural line. They should be the same distance or multiples of distance from the skin to the pleural line. You can see it if the lung is normal. You could also see it if the lung is not normal. We'll talk about why. And if you can find A lines, you'll need to see and identify whether or not the lung is moving or not, and then you can actually make a diagnosis. So this is an example of A lines. So anybody want to take a guess as to how this image was acquired or what probe? You can type that into the chat. This one's also a little bit challenging because I kind of cut it off at the top. But this image you can see deeper than, whoopsies, deeper than the other images. So if it's deep, you're using a lower frequency probe. This one's a little bit more challenging. So I got a vote for cardiac and a vote for curvilinear. Um, based on the narrowness, I would go with cardiac or phased array on this one. So the very first hyperechoic line that you see is the pleural line. And if you see all this black here and black here, that is that posterior rib shadow here and here. And we're seeing between one intercostal space. So you got pleural line and then you've got these reflections, reverberations. That's a fun word to say. And I did chop the crop a little bit. I cropped the image a bit too much. But the distance from the probe to the pleural line is the same distance between this portal line and this A line, this A line, this A line, this A line, and this A line. So all that is to say, this area of lung has aerated lung, probably. Here's another example of A lines. This is the linear array probe, straight across, rib shadow, rib shadow plural line. From here to here should be the same distance between this to the first A line and this A line and the second A line. All right, so hopefully with that, and everyone's still awake, join us for a question. How many aliens do you see in this image, which you don't see yet, but the choices are six, seven, eight, nine, or 10. And, oh, dang it, you don't get to see the picture. Hang on, everyone close their eyes. All right. And I'm gonna leave this on here for a bit. I'll give you one minute. And if you want to type your answer, feel free to type. You can scan the Slido QR code and we can see everyone's answers, but I'd have to go back a slide. So, ooh, I got, I got votes for six, seven, eight, and nine so far in the chat.
Pretty good, pretty good. I'm gonna go forward, really. Now, if I go forward, it'll show you the answer. Hmm. That's pretty good. All right, let us count the lines. This is the plural line. And then we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And yes, you might argue the point that you don't actually see it, but I was gonna give I was gonna give it the eight. <laughs> don't be bad. It's not that important. All I wanted to do, the purpose of this exercise was to make sure that everyone can now identify an A-line. So great job. All right. B lines. B lines are very um, specific artifacts that are created. They have several defining characteristics, and I've written them all here. They have been described as comet tails. These are vertical. They're very well defined. They are hyperechoic, i.e. white. They're dynamic, so they should move. They arise from the plural line. They erase A lines. And they spread like a laser to the edge of the screen. Um, and what do they represent? They represent thickening of the interlobular septa. If you see beelines, you can ask yourself, well, what does this mean? Um, if they're far apart, if they're close together, how many they are, where in the where in the lung are they? Are they at the top of the lungs, the base of the lungs, the anterior, the posterior? Lots of different things that they um, potentially could represent. Generally, if they're wide and they're everywhere, they may be something more diffuse versus if they're very close together, it's probably more likely intraalveolar. This is probably, depending on where you practice, might be more common to see closer together that are narrow. Everybody that sees beelines wants to call it fluid. It can be fluid, but it is not specific for fluid. These are examples of beelines. So this is to show you the dynamic part of it. As a still image, you should be able to recognize that this is one fat beeline or confluent. There may be several B lines all joined together. So again, skin, plural line, and you see these comet tails, lasers, headlights, whatever you want to call them, shining all the way down that extend the entire length of the screen. More examples of, this is a curvilinear ultrasound probe image. You got very distinctive separate comet tails, B lines. Here, they're more closely spaced together. Here, they're a little bit further apart and they're very wide. And this, these are all ultrasound images of these people's chests with their corresponding lung CTs. The black arrows are showing you where the probe was when they got that image. So here and here. I actually can't see where, because this is so diffuse, it wouldn't have mattered where you scanned on the chest, but you're going to see something like that. You put a stethoscope on one of these people's lungs, and they may all sound the same. Crackles, crackles, crackles. So your ears can deceive you, and your image might deceive you on what might be going on. And we'll put this all together when we start to apply what you're learning as far as we're still talking about artifacts at this point, but hopefully it's very clear what the differences between an A-line and a B-line are. Other artifacts that are really not that clinically useful, but if you, I get grabbed a lot to say, what is that? <laughs> and sometimes I know have no idea. And you're like, no, did it meet criteria, all the defining criteria for a B-line? Um, e and Z lines are described because sometimes you're just like, I don't really know what this is, but it does not meet criteria for a B line, so I got to call it something else. E line is a B line, but it comes from the chest wall. It's not coming from the plural line, so it's a vertical projection off of the chest wall. So um, either it's someone's got a lot of soft tissue, someone's got sub Q emphysema, it's a reflection of something that's very, very bright, usually diaphragm or pericardium. Don't necessarily want you to know that. Um, sometimes you just need to know what's not applicable to you. It's like, nope, that's not the law. 
Z lines actually do arise from the plural line, but they don't go all the way to the bottom of the screen. They don't erase A lines completely. They don't really move and we don't really know what they mean. So <laughs> apologies for that, but at least they have a name. They're not related to me. I did not name them, even though my last name is Z. All right. So you're like, I'm not sure why I'm listening to this talk. I would never use lung ultrasound. I can just get a chest x-ray. Everything will be fine and dandy. I've been doing this for however long you've been doing it. And we've been just fine doing clinical skills plus chest x-ray. Lots of papers out there kind of demonstrating that lung ultrasound is actually superior to chest x-ray. For pneumothorax, if your lung is normal, if you've got an alveolar interstitial pattern, if you've got a consolidation, pleural fusion, and much, much more. I sound like a store selling something, because I am. Um, just more papers. I just showed you all these papers from 1999 all the way to mod present day comparing chest x-ray to lung ultrasound. So why we haven't really adopted it as a profession yet, I think we're getting there. It's just a little bit more slow going than I would like. So the big paper that I have here, it's just showing, this is the meta-analysis of all these papers. If you're not familiar with research, basically a meta-analysis just looks at all published papers that are studying the same topic and try to um, collate all of the folks' conclusions into one paper, which is really nice. All right, how do we do this? How do we scan patients? So you could do it anyway. I mean, if COVID, if COVID taught us anything, we could scan patients upside down, <laughs> literally. Um, but you could scan a patient sitting if they're more comfortable. You could do it if they're laying down. If you're laying down, you may want to pull their arms out or abducted. If they're able to have their arms over their heads, it gives you better access to the chest. Um, a full lung exam is 24 points. It's 12 on each lung. You're going to be scanning anteriorly, anterior X, posterior X, and posteriorly. I, as a critical care doc, don't have time for that. <laughs> I usually scan at four points, and I'll show you those four points in a minute. Which probe do I grab? My first go-to would be grabbing my curvilinear phase. Either way, I think they're fine, um, whichever you decide. Some, some machines will only have one or the other, so you should be flexible. The linear really is not going to give you everything you need unless you're specifically looking for the plural line or, say, one of the residents you know, puts a, a central line in their neck and then you get called to the room because they can't breathe and the probe is still sitting in the, on the machine. You can scan and make sure there's still lung slide there. Whenever you're scanning lung, keep your probe marker orientation towards the head. So it doesn't matter if they're sitting or laying flat, as long as that probe dot, and I'll show you what dot we were talking about, is always towards the head, then you know where up is, down is, left is, right. Try not to use up and down because it's confusing. I try to use the words superior, inferior, or cephalad, or caudad. If you're not familiar with those terms, they're all the same thing. We have lots of terms in medicine that describe the same thing, which is very frustrating. Um, but I'll say superior, inferior, lateral, medial. And obviously you want to be in an intercostal space because if you're scanning on top of ribs, you won't see a whole lot. All right, so picture of a chest, just a reminder, what are you looking at where you're scanning? So the 12 points anteriorly, I'll go mid clavicular line and I pick three points, you know, somewhere here, somewhere here, somewhere here. And you're gonna do that anteriorly, anterior axillary, posterior axillary, and then posterior. So if you've got three points here, three points here, three points here, three points here, you've got 12 points, and you can do it on both sides. Very famous paper by Dr. Lichtenstein, he described the use of using this, and this is in 2008. I mean, this is kind of old, but, um, kind of landmark, he described a protocol. So instead of just grabbing a probe and smearing gel everywhere and just kind of scanning willy nilly, you can do that. This is kind of what I learned initially and I kind of still apply it. But what is the blue protocol? He studied people doing lung ultrasound over four years and they applied this specifically to these patients with respiratory failure and described different patterns of what they saw. A line pattern, B line pattern, we'll just, we'll talk about what that means. And what he came up with is very common diagnosis of why people can't breathe. Is it pulmonary edema? 
Are they having a COP or asthma exacerbation? Does this person have a PE? Is there a pneumothorax? Is this a pneumonia? And by describing what each of these conditions look like based on these profiles, they did a really darn good job of making diagnoses. Better than just clinical, all right, um, just clinical assessment, I guess I would say. So to describe them, they would say, hey, if I've got cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which you would all get in report, right? This person comes in, can't breathe, they have a history of heart failure, and they're getting diuresed, right? You, you could just know that. But we made the diagnosis with ultrasound. These folks were blinded to their initial diagnosis, and they just have people scanning them with ultrasound. And they, they came up with the diagnosis with not any other information. And they described that as the B profile. Diffuse bilateral B lines associated with lung sliding. So anytime you describe something, you, you need to make sure you have lung slide or no lung slide. All right. So you got, do you have A lines? Do you have um, sliding or no sliding with the pneumothorax? You would expect no lung slide. Do you have a pneumonia? And it shows you all the numbers of where, how they got. And it was really, really good. I have the statistics on another slide. Um, but this is a actually linear probe, which I probably wouldn't use for this. But, but he described three lung zones. This is where my three points come from, you know, mid clav, you know, one here, one here, one there. Two would be anterior axe, three would be posterior axe, and then zone four. Again, if your patient's supine and can't breathe, it'd be very difficult to do posterior, but if you want to, you can get the money shots are gonna be where gravity, uh, so if the patient's laying flat towards the bed is, can be helpful. All right, more of the same thing that I've already described. So if you're gonna grab that probe and your patient is supine on their back, you wanna scan anterior, high or superior, out to the side laterally, and posterior inferior. Each time you scan, you're gonna identify, hopefully, three things. Can I see my bat wing? Is my lung sliding or not? Do I have A-lines or not? So on the anterior superior point, somewhat mid clav this is a little bit medial for me, but whatever. And I identify a bat wing. So I put my probe on, my probe marker is towards the head, which, um, for just general standard lung ultrasound, you should be in either the lung preset or abdominal preset, not the cardiac preset. What does that mean? The probe dot should be on this on the left, meaning the head should always be here and the feet will be here. So you know as you move up or superiorly and versus when you go down. So your image should not be backwards. There's a lot of like hands on, if you can get your hands on a probe, that'd be super helpful. So my probe marker orientation again is towards the head. So my dot would be here. So say this is the second rib, this would be the third rib. And this is the second intercostal space. So I got my bat wing, I got my rib, I got my plural line, I got my rib. Excellent, wonderful. That's step one. Step two is their lung slide. So these are static images, but hopefully the lung you can very clearly see moving left to right, right to left. And then do I see A-lines? Now, this person does not have enough depth on the machine or the probe can't see that far down, but I do see one A-line, just one. And I want to get this, that way, lung slide, A-line on every area I scan. So if I move laterally, now this is a different probe, so I've just come off the chest and I've slid down here. My probe marker is still towards the head. So I don't know, nipple line, we'll say that's four or five. Okay, rib four. So my rib four would be actually here. Five would be here. I got plural line. I got one A line. So that way, long slide, plural line. At this location, you could say there's aerated lung. A-lines will only appear if there's aerated lung. Does that mean that person still can't be in respiratory stress? They absolutely could be in respiratory distress because if they got a PE, you'd be like, guys, that's not my area. Uh, Albuterol is not gonna help that. <laughs> but that's only at this location, right? And then your last area is gonna be posterior inferior. This is money shot for me. I really love this point as some of y'all might know. And you're gonna look down here and you say, that's not a lung, <laughs> that is liver, right? So don't look here yet. What do I need to see? I need to see bat wing. You're like, I don't see bat wing. A-line, long slide. 
So if I could freeze that, oh, oh, oh darn, sorry, technical difficulties. I don't know if I can freeze this. Stop, oh man, stop. Okay, so there's actually a rib here. You might see a rib here or not, but what we didn't talk about yet is that diaphragm coming in and out. But your pleural line is here in blue. You actually see an A line in green and another A line. But because we're so inferior and posterior, as that person breathes, they're pushing that diaphragm down. And so your liver comes up and down. This is a little bit of kidney. And this is your spinous processes of your spine. So lots of my RTs here are learning about the belly, actually. And you can actually find fluid here. You're like, nope, it's not the lung. <laughs> Something's going on in the belly. I just don't know what. This red line is that diaphragm. It's a bright white hyperchoic. So you can actually see the end of the lung, inflating, deflating, inflating, deflating. Super helpful. If you've got just the teeniest, tiniest amount of pleural fluid, you know, you get that plain film and the radiologist is like, oh, blunting of the diaphragm could be atelectasis versus pleural fusion versus blah, blah, blah. This is 100% specific for it. You've put your probe there, gravity, fluid goes down and down or inferiorly. If they're flat, it will just, it'll pile. You can say exactly, and you can say no. Yeah, they have a pleural fusion. Or they'll say, oh, let's get a cat, cat scan on the lung, see if we can tap it. You just put your probe on there. And you're like, yeah, no, it's, it's not big enough. I mean, if you've got a really brave, bold doctor, I guess, that's wanting to stab, put a needle in the chest, like, I just don't know how much fluid is in there. It may not be worth it. All right, back to the blue protocol. These are the patterns in which he um, described. So you can read all this wonderful text, but the A profile, which is considered normal. Each of these pictures are the same picture on these all these areas. So bat wing, bat wing. You got one A line, bat wing, A line, all the same, and all four areas. So the only thing you can't tell is there a lung slide or no lung slide. If there is lung slide, there is normal area. I say normal. <sighs> Sorry. Well, can you think of a condition? And you can put your answer in the chat because I don't have a question for this. Can you think of a condition where you have aerated lung, but they can't breathe? Everywhere. Everywhere you scan, you're like, I got bat wing, I've got lung slide, I've got A-line pattern. I don't even know why I scanned this person, but they clearly are having trouble breathing. Using your stethoscope could be helpful in this situation because the answer might be obvious. But if you want to put in the chat, what condition or conditions can you think of? A person can't breathe, but they have aerated lung under all the points. So asthma is correct. Those people are hyperinflated. They can't get the air out, but you still have lung slide. Pneumothorax. Yes, you will see a line pattern. However, there will be no lung slide. So based on this image, Dan, you're absolutely correct. You can't tell that there's lung slide because I didn't give you any um, dynamic, showing you anything dynamic. Emphysema, same thing like asthma, hyperinflated. COPD, very good, perfect. Asthma, yes. PE, excellent. So yeah, you're like, again, not a lung problem. I mean, it kind of is a lung, it's a lung artery problem. But a PE, you're going to have a person that is super tachypnic, can't breathe, but they're, they have aerated lungs. The problem is closer to the heart. So wonderful. Great job, guys. Beeline pattern. So this person has beelines everywhere. So you've got beeline, 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 and then all the different chunks of the lung, it's everywhere. So it's a diffuse process. Could it be pulmonary edema? Absolutely. 100% could be pulmonary edema. This person still could have ILD, pneumoconioses. You got to put that into the clinical context. So yes, obviously clinical history is very helpful. All my mean questions are, you're not going to get any history. You don't know their age. You don't know they're here. People just take the probes, throw it on the chest and see how good you are at ruling out conditions. This person does not have normal aerated lung anywhere. So it's unlikely to be an asthma. Lots of folks come in and are like, oh, it's a it's a COPD and CHF exacerbation. I'm like, well, which one is it? Occasionally it is both. But wet lungs tend to not be inflated. So technically, they're not having any problems getting the air out. They can't get the air in. So let's figure out which one it is. So they'll say the middle profile is predominantly B, suggesting cardiogenic pulmonary edema. You would only know that if the person came in with a history, a heart history, they've got B lines everywhere. And they're saying that you can absolutely say it's probably not a COPD exacerbation. It's probably not a PE. And it is definitely, definitely not a pneumothorax. Okay. Because why? 
if anyone wants to be brave. How do I know for 100% certainty in this location that there is no pneumothorax here? How do I know? What did I say defines B lines? If you have a B line. This one's harder. A B line is created by the visceral and parietal pleura rubbing against each other because it's the thickening of the interlobular septa. You can't see that if you have a pneumo because the visceral and parietal pleura are not an approximation. So, anyway. And the far right panel is a mix, right? So this is the left, oh, I don't know which one. This might be the right chest. We're going to say that this is anterior. And this is, and these are boobs right there. Okay, so this is the right chest, this is the left chest. So on the right side of the chest, you've got A-line pattern. And on the left side of the chest, you've got B-line pattern. So what is it probably not? It doesn't make sense to be cardiogenic pulmonary edema because cardiogenic pulmonary edema should be diffusely everywhere. Why would it be unilateral? So then you ask yourself, what processes would be unilateral? I got a wet lung over here. I got a dry lung over here. Well, if there's lung slide, you know this is not a pneumothorax. So why do I have, quote, wet lung over here? Maybe it's a pneumonia, just a left side of pneumonia. So how all of these different um, patterns can be useful in making a diagnosis. This is just the written descriptions of all the different profiles. We talked about A line, I mean, A profile, B profile, A, B profile, B prime, C prime. Well, this, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily worry about that too much. You can read the paper and I have the reference and I have the reference link in the references. Decision tree. So person can't breathe and I am blind, except I can see my ultrasound images. Lung slide, numero uno. Is it there or is it not? If it is not there, and you have B or A profile, lung point, I'll tell, I'll tell you what lung point is, boom. Without, I don't know what it is. If you have A line, lung point, pneumothorax. If it's this, it's this, it's this. It's just very well-defined protocol because you guys can do this. Do you have lung slide, yes or no? Pulmonary edema, and this, this really covers a lot of diagnoses. You know? And the only one where albuterol might be helpful is here. All right, so it might be helpful in pneumonia too if you don't need some bronchodilation to help. But you can teach, you can definitely help teach uh, if you're especially at an institution where there's lots of learners. Anyway, conclusions of the paper for the blue protocol is that it immediately, immediately, so one other thing about ultrasound is time to diagnosis, time to treatment. How long does it take to package up a patient and go to CT? Yeah, yeah, you could come get a chest x ray. That also takes a little bit of time. Lung ultrasound is not something you order that the radiologists do. You guys will be armed with a probe in your hand and you can, like a stethoscope, you throw the probe on the chest and it, it gave you the diagnosis very often. And then you can start treating them and that's what we're looking for, time to treatment. All right, so this um, portion we're gonna just show, I'm gonna show you hopefully quite a few examples of things and you just drill it in your mind. Like I've seen this image over and over and over, but that's kind of the point. So here we go. All right, so we already talked about sliding long. Oh, what happened in the chat? I can't see the chat. Oh, there it is, okay. Uh, lung pulse is not something we've described yet, but we will. Ooh, what happened? Plural line, A lines, B lines. All right, so I think for your armamentarium, these are things that you should be able to identify once you get your hands on a probe and start scanning people. So. Lung pulse, it says right there. Lung pulse equals transmitted heartbeat. So the trouble is when you're scanning the left side, right? So you scan the left side, you're kind of second, third intercostal space. That's actually where I teach my residents to do um, cardiac echo. But guess what? The lung actually surrounds the heart. So as the lung inflates, it can actually pass in front of the heart. However, if you're throwing it on there and you don't, you just don't know if there's a lung slide there and you're just really, really, really looking, you're like, oh, she said that I should look for lung slide, blah, blah, blah. But it just bounces back and forth. You can shoot down, the machine will do this for you, but you have to push a button that says M mode and it will only send that beam of sound down that line. So bat wing, let's identify our structures. We've got rib shadow, rib shadow, bat wing, plural line, bat wing. And I want to know if that this location 
there's movement or long slide. And what M mode does is it takes this line and then it goes over time. So this only works if the structure of what you're looking at is moving. If the structure you're looking at doesn't move, then it will just be the same all the way across. And you can very clearly hopefully see that there is a difference between this grainy grainy and then that grainy grainy and then this and then that. And then. Anyway, that's the heart beating. So I'll ask you the question. Here's another example, long pulse. Do you think that you can use that point then to determine if there is a pneumothorax at that location? Type in the chat, yes or no. Can you make a determination about whether or not that lung is up if you see lung pulse? Yes or no? Yes, very good, because this is only created, this lung point, it's only created if the visceral and parietal pleura are up against each other. So if you see lung pulse, that will equate having lung slide at that location. It just so happens to be transmitted um, from the heart. Cardiac arrest patients, you get called for code blue, doing CPR, patient gets intubated, everybody looks because Dr. Z ran out with her probe and all we're doing is staring at the heart. I can't find the heart because the lungs are hyperinflated and you just see lung pulse. No pneumo there. What I need you to do as an RT is please don't stop bagging the patient. <laughs> because if you stop bagging the patient, I can't see if the lung is inflating or deflating and it might look like there's a pneumo there. So you do actually have to have inflation and deflation of the lung in order to create lung slide. So that is one thing. So um, we'll talk about those scenarios in which it may not be um, useful. All right. If you have a sliding lung, you know 100% there is no pneumo at that location. So unless you're doing all 12 points, you still can say, I mean, you can get the chest x-ray, but you should feel really good about it if you've got lung slide. And it's not always super clear. So it's totally okay to get the chest x-ray because you see everything at once, but really, really helpful, much faster. If you do not have lung slide, as I kind of insinuated before, it indicates a possibility of pneumothorax. So I'm gonna ask again, shout out. I'm really loving all the engaged folks here. Besides you as the RT not bagging the patient, what other causes could cause? Is that a question? What other things could cause you to not have lung slide that is not a pneumothorax? Type in the chat. <laughs> Death, definitely. Uh, there should be no spontaneous respirations in the pronouncement of a patient who is dead. So there is no inflation or deflation of the lung. So that is correct. Pneumonia, that is a very good one. Um, at that location, your lung is full of schmutz. The air cannot get to that left lower lobe. It just can't get there. And so I put my probe on there and I don't see lung slide, but I see beelines. So yeah, that one's harder. Effusion. All right. Um, effusion will basically push right the lung away from the chest wall. So you don't have a visceral and prior pleura rubbing against each other. The lung will be moving maybe, but you yes, by my pure definition, you will not see lung slide. Plural friction rub. Um, I will say for that, that one, Mona, if you have plural friction and you're hearing, you're, you're hearing something. Now, if you're getting a friction rub because you have had lung surgery or talc pleuridesis or something that has physically stuck the visceral and parietal pleura together, it could be scar tissue, and you hear a noise. Usually if you hear a noise, you're hearing movement. Um, but yeah, that one, that one would be a little bit more challenging. Mucus plug, excellent. That's very common, right? So if you had a stethoscope, you would be like, I would just listen and put my stethoscope on the chest and I would not hear any air movement. That's true. So the same, same concept as death. 
you're not getting inflation deflation of long because you have plugged off. That is absolutely something that could happen. But you can do something about that, right? You're going to go down there and jiggle them all up and suck, suck it all out. And hopefully you can reassess with your probe um, before someone has to go down there with a broccoscope. Hypoplastic lungs. Yes, anything, again, and if someone's starting about children, uh, full disclosure, I do not take care of babies or children. <laughs> But yes, if you are an adult and you had a hypoplastic lung, uh, inflation, deflation is not a thing. So all oh, wonderful answers. So I've got apnea, right? So you're not bagging the patient. They are dead. They are apneic. Um, their main stem intubated. They have a mucus plug. All of those things. No inflation, no deflation, no lung slide. Not a pneumo. Pleural adhesions, like I said, stuck up. They're stuck together. Main stem intubation, main stem occlusion, very severe parenchymal disease um, could cause that. All right, more review. We talked about B mode versus M mode. So B mode, brightness, that's gonna show you that, let's look again, rib shadow, rib shadow, floral line, wonderful. Do I have sliding lung? Can you see sliding lung on this image that doesn't move? What do you think? Yes, because I said in a static image, now you don't know where I'm shooting the line because this hasn't activated yet, but you would see a line straight down here, straight. And it tells you over time. So one image of M mode will show that person that you're demonstrating motion. And how am I demonstrating motion? So the distance from here to here or here to here is the distance from here to here. And you're like, well, how do you know that? Well, I just, I just know that. So there's actually, a, there's actually rulers. This is a very old image. Okay, each of these is a centimeter. So I know from the top of the screen to, I don't know, I'll say like one and a half, two. That's where the plural line is. So then you'd be like over here. Again, there is a ruler here, which you can't see. It kind of get blurs, blurs with the image. Then I know, yep, that's plural line. But I can clearly see a distinction between this and fuzz fuzzies. okay? Fuzz McFuzzies makes me think that artifact is happening because lung is moving. And so what they will call this is the seashore sign. So you're going to look for a seashore. You're like, what seashore? I'll show you. Okay. Everybody wants to be there right now. But what you're looking for is a seashore and a sandy beach. Sandy beach is all of this. Seashore is looking out that way. So you're sitting here looking out towards the horizon. So the waves, which is not wavy, but it's like, straight across waves, that is the, the chest wall not moving. Now, if your patient is an extremist or they are seizing or shaking or anything else that would make your muscles move, this will not be as straight as this looks. But if you're just calmly breathing or on the vent resting breathing, you should be able to see lung slide fairly well. Okay, so if you do not have lung slide, Notice I did not say if you have a pneumo, but if you do not have lung slide at that location, so what are these? Plural line, A line, A line. I'm like, I just don't know if there's lung slide there or not. You can do M mode across that point. This is telling you at this distance at two centimeters, that's where the plural line is. And I've got uh, maybe A line in there and maybe A line in there, but really looks all the same all the way across. They'll call this the barcode sign because it looks like that. When I say plural line, this is not visceral parietal pleura together. This is only visceral pleural. This is only the chest wall side of things. And that's why you don't see the granulation because there's no movement there. But because it's so bright, it reflects or reverberates here and here. So you still see a line pattern, but no lung slide. And you could prove that because you have this barcode. Other folks, if you read about lung ultrasound, you're like, I'm going to learn all about lung ultrasound. They say it's a stratosphere sign. I don't know why. <laughs> because the stratosphere is only that layer and not all of the layers. But anyway. All right. More about pneumothorax. You're like, I'm so tired of hearing about pneumothorax. Okay. So we have a very, uh, very moderate to large size pneumothorax as shown here on the CAT scan, right? All this air. And my lung has shriveled up do nothingness. This person also has some interstitial lung disease. Lovely. So I put the probe marker here, laterally and posterior. This is the PLAPS point, posterior lateral point here. 
And what do I see? I actually see lung that is all the way up on the chest wall. And then I don't have lung on the chest wall. Lung all the way up, no lung all the way up. Oh, so I get my curvilinear, my handy dandy curvilinear probe. I got bat wing, rib, plural line, rib. And I put M mode through this point. And what do I see? I got a barcode and I have a sandy beach. What do we call that? We call that long point. It is literally where the lung stops inflating and deflating that is connected to the chest wall. Precise, very specific for pneumothorax. Mm -hmm. I hope this makes sense. So you, this is a much nicer example, a live image. I've got lung coming in and out. This point, it shows you how big that pneumo is. In another example, where you put the probe, as the lung inflates, it crosses the field. And as it deflates, then I have a whole bunch of non-sliding lung. Not all the images are this beautiful, but this is a really, really, really beautiful image. What would create this? potential appearance that is not a pneumothorax, that's normal. <laughs> it's not a very fair question. I wouldn't say, I mean, you could say atelectasis is normal, but I'm going to say like totally normal. That lobe occlusion is all. Agree. Some of these things can show you where lung is or is not. But I would say that a lobe occlusion is not normal. It's not fair. It's not fair. It's wherever the lung stops normally. So where does the lung stop normally? At the bottom right where the diaphragm is. If you remember the picture that I showed you way back at the beginning of this talk of the curvilinear probe at the posterior lateral point where the liver really comes in and out, that's kind of a lung point, right? Because the lung physically ends. Like there is no more lung. But I don't know if that is helpful to ones to you all thinking about how long it plays in place. All right, let's move on. What do you see here? And don't retype pulmonary edema because that's the title of the slide. What image artifact, image artifact or image artifacts do you see here? Mm-hmm. Anything else besides B lines? Yep, big fat confluent B line. Actually, you can see two different ones here, and some of them they come together. So bat wing, I got rib shadow, rib shadow, plural line. It is very clearly sliding because why? I can't really create that. Uh, oh, lung point. I don't see a lung point in this particular image. Now, I granted, I, you can zoom in on this, decrease your depth, and really pull in if you're like, I'm just not sure. I feel like, remember, you might not see any lungs, quote, slide when there's rib shadow because you can't see anything behind the rib. But I, when I'm looking at this line here, that whole line seems to go back and forth and back and forth. So I don't think that I can call a lung point here. What I would like for you to be able to call presence of beelines, presence of lung slide, done at this location. With the clinical history that this person has pulmonary edema, I would expect to see this pretty much everywhere. Now, as the patient maybe hopefully is getting better, you may see less lung zones with pulmonary edema, right? So the pulmonary edema will most likely hang around in the posterior lung bases. But somebody who's got horrible, diffuse rowels, you're going to see this anterior superior. And as this person becomes more and more euvolemic or drier as he's peed 10 liters, you should hopefully see this start to disappear. Alveolar consolidation. This one I struggled with a bit. How do you make a distinction between atelectatic lung or consolidated lung? Not everything that is a Consolidation is atelectasis. Not everything that's atelectasis is necessarily a consolidation. So, again, airless lung. That's why you 
technically could be true that you could see a bee line there without a lung slide because the air can't get there to cause the inflation and deflation. Fluid-filled alveoli. As you start getting fluid-filled alveoli, you can start to have your bee lines. This could be if you have pulmonary edema as well. So again, don't confuse bee lines with just pulmonary edema. The more you get, they start to blend together into a big confluent bee line. Eventually, it's just all white. Because if you imagine a really thick, fat bee line, it's just all white. Shred sign, I will show you later. Then it becomes really dense. And then eventually, it turns into what we call hepatization. And I'll show you what that looks like. But it is really a process of, and you might only catch them here, or you might catch them here. And then as you scan them day to day, when you do your physical exam, you can kind of see if this changes or not. So hepatization, as the term hepatic, it is another word for liver. It is not the liver. We just call it that because it looks like a liver. Um, if you see air bronchograms, you can see whether or not there is air passage in the actual bronchi. And that'll help you determine if it's pneumonia, a consolidated lung pneumonia versus atelectasis. So let's look at some pictures. And I wish I had a live audience. We could do a pointer. <laughs> what are we looking at? So let's just delineate um, the left side of the screen from the right side of the screen. Tell me if you think the lung is on the left or if you think the lung is on the right. Remember, if you're doing this correctly, your probe marker should be oriented towards the head. And in a lung preset or abdominal preset, your probe marker should always be on the left. I was very wicked and evil and did not show you where the probe marker was. I got votes for left and right. You have 50-50 chance. Good odds. All right. You, left, you leftists just kidding, not politically, are correct, all right? The lung is here. And so, yes, I was evil and wicked. Again, doing it correctly, your probe marker should be here. And if you know your probe marker is here, which is not physically there, I'm drawing it for you right there, the head is here and the feet are there. Therefore, the lung is superior to the belly. This is the diaphragm here. And you're like, well, I, well maybe somebody flipped the machine around. Oh, if you want to use the laser pointer feature, you can be on the remote control. Control, click it. Uh, oh, hello. Hey, look, there's your pointer. Okay, thank you, Keith. Uh, so this is a diaphragm here. So imagine someone's head is here, their feet are here, you're at the posterior. So anterior is here, posterior is here. I'm on the lateral portion. These guys are how I know, 100% that someone didn't flip my image around. These are air bronchograms. This bronchi, like this air is trying to get there, but there's fluid in there and it's going back and forth. Of course, this is a static image. I also kind of know this is this, and this is what I would call a shred sign. It looks like someone took a piece of tissue paper and like tore it in half. But this is the meat of the lung. It is not aerated. This guy looks like this guy, which happens to be this person's liver. And that's why it's called sonographic hepatization. All right. Here's another one. So I'll compare this one, and this one, and this one. So like being at the eye doctor, one or two, one or two. There is a difference between these two images. And why do I say there's a difference? Can anyone, would anyone like to comment on how there might be a difference between this and that? Yes, 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 um, to Robbie. There are more air bronchograms in this image than in this image. Um, both of these views are separating left from right, so this is going to be a sagittal image, um, not transverse. But that's a uh, 
good attempt at an observation of how I'm holding the probe. That's why if you are standard, if the same way you hold the probe every single time, then all your images should look very, very similar. Robbie pointed out, there are air bronchograms all the way up anteriorly and all the way down. So this, so we're gonna call this liver, so this is the right side. This right lower lobe is all pneumonia. This image, this is the first image again, there are only air bronchograms this chunk. And then there is atelectatic lung. And you're like, what well, does it make a hill of beans difference? I mean, maybe it does, maybe it does, but this can show you how big the pneumonia actually is. And at some point, could this spread to the rest of the lobe? It absolutely could. But this, if I covered it up, which I can't cover it up, if you covered up all of this and you say, hey, Dr. Z, I saw a consolidation, that could just be the patient needs more peep. Maybe they have a big belly and they just got atelectasis. Like it doesn't necessarily need antibiotics. If you see this though, very likely it's infectious, right? So there is a difference between atelectasis and consolidation. This one, air bronchograms everywhere. Okay, and that's the main difference between these two. Ooh, this one's fun. What is the difference between this one and this one? This one and this one. Any notable differences? And some of you might be just like, oh, what happened to my bat wing? What happened to my pleural line? What happened to my lung slide? This will, this image is what you're going to get when you're in that posterior lateral view very often when there is pathology. So Juliana said there's fluid. So let's talk about echogenicity again. We now know that this is lung and it's very clearly highlighted. But now we've got this black, black. There's even some black over here. And what did we say black was? Black, it's anechoic, no echoes. And there's no rib here. So I'm like, there's no like giant rib or something that is casting a shadow. If there was something here casting a shadow, you shouldn't see anything here at all. All of this should be black. But what I've got is black, black, black. What all of this is, is anechoic. Anechoic very often is fluid of some kind. It could be fluid, like a pleural effusion. It could be blood. You can't tell based on this image if it's blood or a pleural effusion, or it could be a hemothorax, any of those things. Diaphragm is here. So remember, pro marker on the left, head is here, feet are here. I'm not sure I would like more images because I kind of lose my diaphragm. I'm not sure if there is fluid to the right of the diaphragm as well as to the left of the diaphragm. And why does it make a difference? Maybe this person has heart failure. Maybe this person has cirrhosis. Maybe they have ascites or peritoneal fluid. Uh, or maybe all of this is above. So you could, you know, is it your place, quote unquote, place to tell the doc, hey, I think there's fluid in the belly? Sure. You. This is part of your exam. I mean, anybody can see ascites, like belly out to, and like, uh, I can try to ventilate this person with 20 of peep, but uh, I think you need to do a paracentesis. I think that's very reasonable. I would not be offended. Some of my colleagues may or may not, not here physically, but I, I know sometimes there's like concern to speak up about something like maybe there's some fluid. You should be able to say with 100% certainty that there is or there's not fluid in the belly or in the chest after this talk <laughs> slash putting your probe uh, on the patient. So. Now, different situation. Patient comes in, 20 years old, car accident. Different story. This person could have a hemothorax and a hemoperitoneum, and this person needs to go to the OR. So depending on the clinical scenario, yep, it's absolutely blood. This person needs a chest tube, and they need to go to the OR. This is a positive FAST exam. If you ever hear them in the trauma bay, FAST exam. FAST exams really was only des um, initially designed to detect blood in the belly. But now we can detect blood anywhere. So now the pickle is the cirrhotic person who comes in and wrecked his car. <laughs> it could just be that he has. So that's a little bit of grain of salt of, of what's going on. But our patients don't read textbooks. Oh, there's Bruce. Just to make sure everybody's still awake. Why do I show you Bruce? Uh, Bruce, because Bruce has this really nice shark fin right there. 
because Bruce is a shark, and it is surrounded by the ocean. So look for the shark fin. You'll never forget it, Bruce. Here's just another example, fluid, air bronchograms. This part of the lung doesn't have any air bronchograms. This is, oops, it's atelectatic, diaphragm, liver or spleen. I'm not really sure on this, this one. All right, here's another one. This is really nice shark fin. This person, if I was to judge your image, like if you want to send me your images, I'd say you are not utilizing the far field. Remember near field, far field. Nothing here is giving you anything useful. So what you would really want to do is decrease your depth setting on the machine so that this is bigger, but whatever. We'll just choose to ignore that for now. And they highlighted you in cartoon form where the pleural fluid was, where the diaphragm was, where the liver was, and where the lung is. All right. So your doctor's like, well, thanks for telling me that. Can you actually tell me how much fluid is in there? How much fluid is that? Should I stick a needle in it? Should I not stick it? If I put a needle in here, <laughs> am I going to stab lung? Am I going to stab liver? Is, there, is it worth my time slash is it worth the risk to the patient of causing a pneumo. So, Ralic, nice guy, simple guy, which is what I like, developed a formula. It's pretty good, right? So, the cavity, so you can always detect the volume of the sphere, the volume of the cylinder, volume of all these physics people. And so, what he decided to just measure a whole bunch of people, and you could do thoracentesis and see how much actually came out. But he said, there's lots of folks that have different formulas. I found this one to be the most simple is find the maximum diameter of the effusion in millimeters between the diaphragm and the base of the lung in a patient that is laying flat and they have exhaled, like breathed all the way up. And your volume will be about the distance in millimeters times 20. And if you have a five, cent five centimeter distance, 50 millimeters times 20, there you go. That person's got a liter in their chest done. And that would be totally worth doing. So I don't have a ruler on this guy, but you would take the maximum diameter. So this one's kind of fun. Was it here or is it here? You'd have to trace the diaphragm all the way around, but it's a rough guesstimate from here to here. And here's your scale again. These are each centimeter markings. And if you just kind of transposed I'll do this. From here to here. I mean, there might be five centimeters there. He might have a liter in the chest. A liter is a lot for the lung. If you don't, if you've never watched the flora, it's like the, people start to breathe a lot better after that first 200 that's out. So if it's 200 or more, I'll probably go after it. Um, simple versus complicated. So when you're looking at scans, you're like, yep, I've seen this image. It's like the 17th image you've shown me of a pleural fusion. And then you see that. This is a simple effusion, completely black. This still could be blood, by the way, fresh blood. Fresh blood does not clot right away, so it could just be blood. Old blood will start to layer out here. This is a very complicated effusion. We classify effusions as simple or complicated. We classify them as transudative or exudative. And why we classify them is because the management might change on based on what we think it is. A heart failure patient just straight had too much salt on Thanksgiving and just pulled excess fluid into the pleural cavity versus the patient that has a uh, untreated pneumonia, developed a complicated pleural fusion, then that became an empyema and et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes you can get a pulmonary, uh, like a lung abscess. This is just a hot mess. Like there's stranding and just septations and all kinds of nasty. This, if you got this on ultrasound and you showed that image to your doc and they had just got a chest x-ray, trust me, the chest x-ray is not going to show you all of this delineation. And they're like, yeah, I'm going to do a thoracentesis. That would be inappropriate. This person needs a chest tube, a CT surgeon, a VAS, any of those other options. I say a thoracentesis is inappropriate. You could always stick a needle and just 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 to, for diagnostic purposes, but that person needs a whole lot more. It's way more involved than that, and that should be hopefully very obvious. One of the questions I get from the residents all the time is, how do I know if I should put a chest tube in it? 
or where should I do? Thor is always safe. You just stick a needle in there, get a sample, send it off. But why stick the patient twice if you know you got to put a chest paper in anyways? Oh, look, more pleural effusions. There's Bruce. Hello, Bruce. Very large pleural. I mean, this probably has, this person probably has 1,500 or 2,000, but I don't have a measurement here. Okay. This, ooh, can someone tell me, this is like, mm, what is that magazine for kids? What's the difference between the images? <laughs> tell me what is different between the image on the left and the image on the right that has to do with the technique of acquiring the image, not the content of the image. I'm sorry, I have no prize for you, but if someone in the next 10 seconds can determine the difference in how the image was acquired. So go through your things. Long slide, bat wing, uh, what else did I say? A-lines, like, I don't see any of that. But I don't know when you guys learn chest x-rays, you're like, make sure it's the right patient. Make sure it's the right date. <laughs> this is what something that should always be done when you set up the machine. All right, I'm just kidding. Probe marker, probe marker. Should mm -hmm. always be on the left. So head is here, feet are there. Hopefully, because you're going to put your probe marker towards the head, right? So the lung is superior to the belly. This image, someone left it in the cardiac preset because cardiologists, though, darn those guys, they always have to be right, don't they? Always have to be right. They think they're special because their heart is a left-sided structure, and therefore they changed the notation for everyone and ruined all of our lives. So someone was doing the lung ultrasound correctly, as in their probe marker is towards the head, but the head is here and the feet are there. So the diaphragm is actually down here. So just for simplicity's sake, try to set up the machine so it's the same every single time and you won't have to struggle because the lung is actually on this side. But anyways, all right, that question was not fair. What is the difference between what you see here and what you see here? Is it simple or complicated? Everyone has died. No one can hear me. Oh, hang on. Yeah, good job. Trap. All right, there's stuff. I don't know, Dr. Z, there's stuff in there. There's not stuff over there. Exactly. Run away. It's one way. They call this, so if you haven't gotten the sea creature theme, this is called the plankton sign. I did not make that up. We call this plankton. So I showed you a picture of krill because I don't have a picture of plankton. <laughs> Anyways. This will show you that this is also complicated. Complicated could be blood, it's probably infectious, but there's schmutz inside and it probably needs a chest tube. So the way, I don't know why I put the jellyfish. Oh, I remember why I put the jellyfish. I keep referring to this as Bruce, Bruce's tail. In long ultrasound literature, they call it the jellyfish sign. I don't know why. Because to me, it looks like Bruce's tail and not jellyfish. But if you see jellyfish sign, you're like, man, Dr. Z didn't talk about jellyfish at all. There's your picture of jellyfish. Because for some, somebody thinks that that looks like a jellyfish. All right, moving on. I just think these are all hopefully images that you will acquire and send them to me because long ultrasound is fun. So simple or complicated? Everybody would say resounding, simple. You can't type that fast, it's cool. Resounding, not simple. Looks like broccoli, broccoli. Sorry, that's not a sea creature. I don't know, it's octopus having a baby. Oh, it's very complicated, okay? I'm not sure I would touch that with a needle because I'm not really sure what's long and what's not. This one I would get a CT. Just more, ah, this is a really good one. Simple or complicated? I did fail to teach you complicado. Hmm, could be. I failed to teach you, and this is only happens when I forget because I thought I had lots of slides. 
We talked about depth, how deep you can see. You can change the depth. You can make it less or you can make it less deep, more deep. What I didn't talk to you about is gain. And I don't know how I forgot about gain, but forgive me. Gain is like the volume on a speaker. You can turn the volume up, making everything brighter clockwise, or you can turn it all the way down, making it darker. That's just an artificial com component. So when you submit images and I'm looking at them, I'll say, mm, your depth probably could have been optimized and your gain needs to be optimized. So gain. This image is over gained. Someone try to turn up the volume on the picture to see more. So your whites are way too bright. Like everything is really bright. So when you guys see this wedge looking thing, like maybe there, I don't know, because I think the whole image is too loud. Um, so unfortunately, since I neglected to speak about it, I feel really bad, but just be very careful. One of the learner's mistakes when they're first learning is to turn the volume up. Just try to make everything brighter so you can see. And that's not necessarily super helpful. Um, so you can give me bad feedback about forgetting to teach you about gain. So I don't know. The answer to this one be could be simple, could be complicated. I would turn the gain back down to make sure my whites are not too white. And that is just something you'll learn over time the more you scan. The fractal or shred sign, I'm gonna go back to one of the images before that I mentioned. What that is, that tissue paper. I could take tissue paper, I tear it in half, it has a very jaggedy, jaggedy edge. And it's describing the irregular border between consolidated and aerated lung. It also could be the border between non-aerated lung, but that's not consolidated, if that makes sense. So there's air bronchograms. Lots of words. Um, not super specific, but I'm, I'm going to go back and find one for you. This one was the best one. Jaggedy McJaggedy's here. You don't necessarily see a shred sign here, but there is a distinction between where there were air bronchograms and where there are not. This is where your quote pneumonia starts from where normal lung is. And though not technically a beeline, because you can't tell it's arising from the pleural line, you can kind of see where aerated lung was. Remember, I said it's a progression. You start out with a beeline, then you get multiple beelines, then you have confluent beelines, and then those confluent beelines, a whole bunch of them actually end up turning into a consolidated lung. Um, here, I would say you could maybe say a little bit, but you could kind of see air bronchograms past that. Um, these ones don't have as clear of a shred sign. More effusion, more effusion. Okay. Just another example. Shred sign. This is supposed to be chest wall. <laughs> Though why anyone would use that as an acronym, I don't know. Shred sign looks like the country of India. Uh, here's another example, just the jaggedy, jaggedy, jaggedy. And a few more examples here. They're calling these beelines I, uh, grain of salt because chest walls way up here. So remember, it doesn't technically meet criteria for that. Okay. Kind of slowly getting towards the end of my talk. What else can you use long ultrasound for? Assessment of lung recruitment. And I'm gonna show that here. These are four photos of somebody on a vent. And in the same location, you can see long. And then I'm not sure where diaphragm is supposed to be in here, but we're gonna kind of see it grow. Lung recruitment is like, how many more ribs can I expand my lung? So they're, they're showing you where they scan. So the right anterior up, which I'm guessing is the superior. Then they went to 20. However you believe or not believe in um, recruitment maneuvers, I'm not a believer in recruitment maneuvers. I am a believer that you can recruit recruitable lung. Um, so you can kind of see over time, that line starts to extend further and further and further from five to 20 to 30 to 40 feet. Really cool 
And if you're following a patient from day to day, you can actually see that on chest x-ray if you wanted to, if you use APRV like we do here, uh, much to the chagrin of some of my colleagues, this is really, really cool. Uh, but you could use it for that. Uh, the other thing that you could use it for is helping determine fluid administration. So you're like, well, I'm not the doctor, you're the doctor, you figure it out, which is cool. <laughs> FYI, depending on how sick somebody is, you can couple using your blue protocol in this other protocol that was determined how safe it is to give someone more fluid or not. You know, like nobody likes wet lungs, so let's just never give anybody that can't breathe fluid. Might not be true, um, but it will help us as clinicians determine if I should give this person more fluid or not. Um, I threw in some more just kind of miscellaneous stuff if you're not a believer in ultrasound yet. Um, because one thing is you got to get good at it. You got to, you just got to do it. You just got to keep practicing. Otherwise you won't feel comfortable. And I'm going to say the majority of the time, oh, maybe not majority, when you're scanning lung, it's very underwhelming because you can't see anything because normal aerated lung is just a line pattern, lung slide done, move on next, next move your life. Great question. Can you use it for ET2 placement? The answer is yes. That's the short answer. Um, Back to my pneumonia physical exam. They 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 talked about just th they just took three docs and they were like, hey guys, go see these patients and do physical exam and tell me if you think they have pneumonia or not. And they all sucked at it. They were terrible. <laughs> they couldn't they couldn't agree. They, they doing traditional chest X exam like they they couldn't. Doing lung ultrasound, however, very sensitive, very specific. Across, this is another meta-analysis, 10 studies, over a thousand patients, really, really good at saying, what is pneumonia? Uh, one of our docs here, Dr. Luis, he's like, everybody's got pneumonia, quote unquote, because he's judging people, saying that they have pneumonia, because not all infiltrates are pneumonia. So, more, all the papers. And we prove it by CT. So CT is the gold standard. Yes, if you can get them to CT, it's wonderful. Life is good. But ain't nobody wants to go take a trip to CT if you don't have to, right? especially these intubated critically ill folks. Or if they can't lay flat and they're not vented, you're like, I just don't think this is a good idea. Let's just throw a probe on them. Okay. Almost there, guys. You still think you need a chest x-ray? You are very addicted to your chest x-ray. Unfortunately, I am also still. But what do you think you need it for that lung ultrasound can't help you? This one, free text. And I'm going to take Joelle's comment and put that in there. But don't you need a chest x-ray for ET2 placement? The answer is no. You don't need a chest x-ray, and I'll show you why. But is there anything else that you guys think that you still need it or would like it for? Type it in the chat. Type it in the comments. Type it in the poll, and I will try to address it. And no one is going to dare type anything because... Dr. Z said, you can use ultrasound for everything. <laughs> Rib fracture. Uh, so as an intensivist who only does CPR to break ribs um, <laughs> and not trauma, you actually can um, diagnose rib fractures with ultrasound. It is It would be painstakingly, though, because remember, you can only see what is under that location and it would take you forever so i agree if i am actually looking for a rib fracture i will get a chest x-ray aeration of lung fields so no uh roberto you don't need a chest x-ray to see um, your aeration because if you can again mm -hmm. are you going to do a 24 lung point exam on every you're probably not but you, you don't need a chest because it's a, you're asking a very specific mm -hmm. clinical question like which part of my lung is arid? Is it nice to have a one snapshot and you get a chest x-ray and it looks totally normal? Do I need to sit there? You probably don't. But then you could have listened to the chest and like they're not even here for a respiratory complaint. Chest x-rays are not evil. It's just, if your institution is choosing wisely, you don't need to get films every day on intubated patients because you could be doing your um, ultrasound. Just like you take, you listen to your lungs every day. Keep the radiology tech from getting worse. That is really true. Because I've been told that rad techs get paid per x-ray, and that also is good for their lives. Uh, what about determining lung size, sizes for donation? Quick and dirty, probably need to get a CT or chest x-ray for donation, um, Juliana. You could determine lung size with the ultrasound, 
it would probably take longer. Masses, uh, like lung tumors, lung cancers. For screening, still need CT, absolutely. Um, you can find tumors on ultrasound. You'll basically scan the lung and you're like, what is that? <laughs> and, it, and it could be a tumor and you'll probably get a CT. Um, chest x-rays might show you like a Goomba that's like rounded, kind of in the right upper lobe. Is it TB? Is it not? Um, ultrasound really won't help you probably be specific about what it is. You'll probably get a CT for that as well. I'm not dissing CAT scans at all. CAT scans, again, still a gold standard, screening, lung cancer, all of the things. I, again, my usage of the ICU, in the ICU is point of care, rapid fire, rapid response, met teens, um, somebody in distress. I can't get imaging, and I don't know where radiology is because they're over in the towers, and <laughs> they're not bringing. Anyways, it's just time to diagnosis might be faster. Whole chest picture, exactly. You can't get a whole chest uh, picture with just where you are in the ultrasound. Uh, is there something? Is there special credentialing for licensure on this? Um, there are lots of institutions that will hand out certificates for ultrasound. I don't know specifically. I think if it's starting into the uh, RT world, I, I don't think they exist. If you are interested in ultrasound, you go to something like the Ultrasound Academy. Um, they will do everything, so DBT. And again, it is more provider-based. There might be something in the future for RTs to do their own and have experts in the field and. Uh, issue some certification, but I don't think at this point that there is. All right. Great, great questions. Or come with work. Yes, Keith, come work with us at JPS and I will absolutely teach you. And I'm not sure what kind of uh, piece of paper um, we do. It's it's kind of like any nursing skill. So like the nurses, um, they can either do CRT or they do the A-line class or heart class and they get quote checked off. And it might be something you could add on your CV that somebody, if you're looking for a job, you're like, well, what is that? I didn't, what do you mean you do lung ultrasound? Um, it would just be something cool, a little tool belt. Uh, but at some point it might be a thing. Just like um, the critical care light, like critical care board. I don't know if you, for RTs, you guys take something special for that and you get credit for the extra learning you guys do. All right. Um, I did put a slide on this because I was hoping someone would ask because this is what I said. It's like, I'm super neurotic about my ET2 positions. I want them between the head of the clavicles and above the crina. It's two centimeter, one centimeter, one and a half centimeter, whatever. As long as it's below the clavicles and above the crina, I'm a very happy camper. However, if you're like going to be a purist and ultrasound like me, don't be like, Z, just kidding. If it's too high, if your tube's too high, one, you'll either hear a cuff leak, right? Two, you can scan right in that sternal notch and, she, and show that the end of the tip of the tube. It is challenging. It is hard to do. It is not something I do in my daily practice. If your tube is too low, then you're not aerating one lung. If you main some the right or main some, you won't get air on the left. So this was a, someone's argument that you don't need to do uh, chest x-ray post intubation. You throw the probe on, you're like, I hear breast sounds, I hear breast sounds. Same thing. I have lung side, I have lung side. The tube is definitely not too low. If it's too high, again, if you're not hearing a cuff leak, it's probably fine. That would be an example of how to do it. If you notice he's holding a linear array probe because it's a very superficial structure, the trachea, you can feel the trachea. So that's how superficial, you don't need the bigger probes. It would probably not be helpful to you. Oh, did you actually, not you, did you, your provider intubate the esophagus? Well, one, you shouldn't have bilateral lung slide, nor should you have bilateral breath sounds, but what you see here is the anterior ring of the trachea, and then there's another little line there, and that is actually the end of the tube. You're getting shadowing just like you would a rib because you can't see necessarily any air. Air does not transmit ultrasound very well at all. So just like normal air should just have A-line, 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 you won't see anything past it. If, however, you see a giant old tube on the, and you're like, that's trachea and that's a tube, mm, tra tube's not in the right place. All right, I thought you were doing your first person answer today. Okay, uh, what else do I have here? Here's just another example of an ET tube. All right, and here is my first case. This is not Flem Fighter yet. This is just uh, my last attempt of getting you, on, you guys to engage. So you get called to evaluate an intubated patient whose vent is alarming. That never happens, I'm sure. It's not your patient. You just get, hey, RT, this person, like, I have a name. Thank you. While the RN is attempting to place a Dophoff tube. If you don't know what a Dophoff tube is, it is a type of nasogastric tube. He is becoming hypotensive and his stats are dropping. 
you grab your handy ultrasound and start, you hit the 100%, but you silence the alarm, you hit 100% like everybody does. You grab your handy ultrasound that you're wearing in your fanny pack on your waistband, like I do, I can model it for you. And you start scanning and you see this. The intern arrives at the bedside and is looking very frantic and he asks for a stat chest x-ray. And you show her this image. What would you suggest? I'll let you watch it for a few more seconds because I don't have it on the next slide. I have all the options on the next slide. Five, four, three, two, one. These are your choices. And answer in Slido. Because if I hit next, then you're going to see the right answer, which I haven't figured out how to fix that yet. Dump off in the lung, remove it. Pneumothorax lung point. D, remove from vent and start bagging. So we're, we're gonna, yeah, this is like, I moved past diagnosis. This is what we do in, on, on medical boards. I don't know how RT boards are. They don't, I don't ask you like what the diagnosis is. I wanna know what do you wanna do about it. I got some D's and some B's and some more D's. So think about what the diagnosis is. And think about what you want to do with it. Bronchoscopy, needle thoracostomy. Oh yes, I want my stat chest x-ray. Take them off the vent, start bagging. I got to do something. Do a recruitment maneuver, get that lung open. All better all. Oh dang it, it does work, okay. No one's answering in Slido. Can we do it this way? Oh, it's 11.47. Oh. All right. Most people said D or B. So B would be needle thoracostomy, and D would be taking off the vent and bagging. Oh, two people have answered. So the correct answer is a needle thoracostomy. Uh, and the reason is because, as you, some of you have pointed out in the chat, this patient has a tension pneumo. And if you took them off a vent and started bagging them, you're just going to possibly make the pneumo bigger, which you can make the argument that if you leave them on the vent, it's going to be the same situation. And, and, and in either case, the patient needs to be decompressed. I'm calling Dr. C. <laughs> Carrie, a 14 gauge angiocath, and I will show you how to dart the patient. Um, so yeah, going back to bronchoscopy. No, no one's going to take a, the, the off a vent and take a look-see. I agree with the stat chest. You can absolutely say, yep, yep, we definitely need a stat chest x-ray. But you could be a little bit more assertive and say, hey, back up. There's a Dophoff in the lung. Like the Dophoff not only is in the lung, it has poked a hole in the lung. And something needs to be done about that. So you need to dart them. And the intern's just gonna look at you like you're crazy because they've never done it before. And it's fine, you're still gonna get chest x-ray, but they're gonna call their attending, I hope, and get a needle in that person's chest. Definitely have seen this happen. Um, be mindful and when you're on the towers, I say towers, med surge floors, if they're putting Dophoffs in on a non- intubated patient that didn't come in for a respiratory issue. Maybe they came in for a stroke and they can't swallow and they need a Dophoff and that person doesn't have a great cough. They may not start coughing when that Dophoff hits the lung, but they might start turning blue and only one side of their chest is working so good. You can dart that patient with the ultrasound. Like I would feel comfortable doing it. I know not everybody would like, oh, but, 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 but I need a chest x-ray. Okay, cool. But in the meantime, your patient can't breathe and you're going to end up intubating them, possibly coding them. And so darting them would be the most appropriate thing to do, in my opinion. That was in case Slido didn't work. And remember, fish are friends, not food. Unless you are at sushi, in which case fish is food. Thank you so much. We're going to go to our phlegm fighter question. So hopefully everybody is sitting on the edge of their seats. Um, like Keith said, you can stay or not stay. I feel like we've taken a lot of time, but here we go. Ready, set, ready, set, ready, set, go. Based on the formula you just learned, how much fluid is in there? Whoever types the correct answer in the chat first apparently gets to pick a prize. Whoops, whoops, I don't know what just happened here. Whoops, oh dear, oh dear, I have failed, I have failed. Well, hopefully you saw it long enough. I don't know what happened to the chat. Keith, help. What'd you do, break it? 
I broke it. Right, it's good so I broke it at the end of the presentation, though. That yes. That is. Was there, is there a winner? Because I can't see the chat anymore. Chat says, uh, let's see, we've got a couple of answers. Uh, we've got one, 160s, we've got 160 milliliters. And so, let me get I believe chat. that I believe that Mark Mangillet is the first person, even though he answered first here, he was off by a 10. So it's the 1600 cc. So what we did is we took the maximum diameter from the long to the diaphragm, which I gave you three choices of measurements. This would be 80 millimeters. 80, 80 zero millimeters by 20 would be 1600 cc's of fluid. 